There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Well, welcome to another edition of Word in Your Ear, where we're joined by an author whose memoir's description of what life was like in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s in Britain is just the funniest and the most detailed and the most evocative account that I think either of us have ever read. It is simply brilliant. And it's the work, of course, of a man who calls himself the bargain basement Baudelaire, the fantastic John Cooper Clark. John, welcome. Lovely to see you. hello, Hello, Mark. Lovely to see you. That's great. Hello, David. And well, yeah, and your book, I want to be yours. I mean, it's so insane. Why has it taken so long to come out? I mean, that's a fantastic story. You must have been itching to write it. Well, all the time, you know, I was racking up more memoirs, and uh, and the time became more and more limited. So, uh, and the opportunity of the uh, epidemic came along, and uh, <laughs> suddenly and the time was available. In there. Yeah, but, yeah. So, did me a favour, really, as is often the case. Uh, you know, everybody else's loss is my gain. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, had you been you've been keeping notes over the years, had you? Uh, no, no, right. no. I've just got a, an eidetic uh, memory. My right. Phenomenal memory. <laughs> it is it's an extraordinary memory. The details. Oh my god. It's a little tiny details like you talk about going to pubs and remembering that there were rooms where you were allowed to swear and rooms when you weren't. You know, I've completely forgot that. Day and I are old enough to remember the 50s. Well, you, so you, 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 the, the line about that it was possible to turn down the colour on the colour TV had me yes. thinking, was it? And then I thought, oh, God, yes, it remember was. Remember when you yeah. could do this? I could. Yeah. Te- technology is disempowering yeah. people <laughs> yeah. at, at hourly rates. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't it? You should have that facility, shouldn't you? You, know, you should. In the interest of very similitude. Well, it's such a fantastic... Oh, and, and, I, and I include the Lake District in this. Well, all right. right. That, yeah, that's one of them places that looks more accurate in a monochrome photograph. Oh, right. Yeah, it would do. You're right. You're it absolutely does. Right. Yeah, it does. Well, yeah. it's the most amazing account of, you know, it's it's, it's kind of pop culture, really. You know, it's, it's, it's clothes, it's schools, it's transport, it's TV, music, adverts, films, clubs. We thought we'd just concentrate on a few areas. And one we thought we were going to uh, talk about, just because it's so rich in detail, is your whole thing about cinema. You remember the whole... 1950s, 1960s cinema so clearly. And in fact, you described cinema as being your babysitter, I think, because your mum used to drop you off there. That's right. But That's what, right. what do you we... remember of the cinema? What was the describe the cinema experience in the 1950s? Well, it was uh, the movies. We had uh, about seven uh, movie theatres. Where I live was more or less the inner city, although it was Salford, it was almost the centre of Manchester. It's, you'd have to have a look at it from a helicopter to understand what I'm saying here. Uh, but... Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Rialto was the uh, the supersonic uh, uh, movie house uh, right opposite our uh, front door. So, uh, you know, my mom always kind of knew where I was if she had to go off somewhere and do some uh, serious uh, shopping in the, in the town centre. That's where I'd be, in the Rialto Super Cinema. I share my enthusiasm with this, uh, this palace, because well, it was palatial, you know, faience tiles. Well, there's a picture of it in my book, a photograph of it in, uh, in my book. But, you know, that, that dressed in faience tiles, you know, beautiful, uh, beautiful um, modern cinema. Anyway, but there were there were there were other you know second and third rate uh, places as well. The County, the Devonshire, the Astor, <laughs> the Hippodrome. Uh, who, were the, but, who were the big heroes at the time? Doris Day, you mentioned. Yeah, I like Doris Day movies. Yeah, yeah. I had this reciprocal arrangement with my mum. Uh, whereby, uh, because we didn't get a TV till 1959, so uh, that was used to go to the movies about six times a week. And uh, (laughs) and I had this uh, reciprocal arrangement with my mum, whereby uh, if we we went to see one uh, Western, I had to go see three, uh, you know, what they used to call women's pictures. Romance films. (laughs) Not necessarily romance. No, they were called women's pictures. Right. You know, uh, Give us some examples. Like, uh, 
like uh, yeah, Mildred Pierce. Yeah. Oh, yes. An, would be I an know. early example of a woman's picture, you know. So there are all these, like, like you know, uh, late period Joan Crawford. Uh, uh, also a, mo a movie like uh, The Best of Everything, starring Leslie Nielsen, Hope Lang, mother of uh, Jessica. And, uh, and a whole load of uh, office girls. It was a kind of com uh, soap opera type movie. But real good. I always found something to enjoy in these movies, even though I was there uh, uh, under sufferance, really. I was kind of my mom's dates, movie dates, because uh, my, my dad wasn't interested in movies beyond James Cagney. And, uh, you know, he wasn't making too many movies in the mid-50s by the mid-50s, so uh, he never went to the movies. He took me to see two movies, actually, both in 1956, as it happens. The Searchers, fabulous. Yeah, oh, yes. And, uh, and uh, Moby Dick, <laughs> fabulous. Both great movies. <laughs> but anyway, this reciprocal arrangement with my mum involved me going to see movies like The Opposite Sex with uh, uh, June Allison. So they were all very sort of sophisticated, kind of uh, aimed at, you know, the kind of uh, <clears throat> the cosmopolitan, you know, the kind of chicks that went on to read Cosmopolitan would be interested in these uh, sophisticated sex, sexual comedies. Right, you know, uh, check out the best of everything. I, I can think of a load of others. All that heaven allows, with uh, Rock Rock Hudson and uh, Jane Wyman. Because you uh, remember, you, know, you remember like all these. <clears throat> well, what I what I what I liked about them was, uh, you know, the the, the whole American uh, shop window that they provided, uh, uh, and sort of kind of clothes that were available to American men. Which, which you know what you would never find in a, in any of our post-war. I mean, you know, you know, in the fifties, you know, in a gent's outfitters, you know, without going to London, you know, you never saw casual clothes, you know, no, casual, no. for men. <laughs> <laughs> you know, holiday wear would be a kind of blazer, yes, grey <laughs> flannels. And uh, an open neck shirt with the collar outside <laughs> yes. the of the blazer, and some kind of hat, some kind of hat. <laughs> it was real weird to see a guy that didn't wear a hat of any kind. So to you know to see this kind of picture of elegant modern, the elegant modern male that was you know the norm in America was really a fantastic treat for me you well know, you're I, really I, obsessive about about the clothes that people wear and it's it's so detailed and so interesting incredible stuff about uh, the mod era about the beanie era but when when did how old were you when you first started kind of taking charge of of what you wore and really became well, concerned about what you you know how you dressed yeah that's a good question you know up until uh obviously you know you kind of i was always expected to fill out you know, because I, I, I had tuberculosis as a child, but when, once I'd got over that, everybody thought I'd kind of start bulking out a little bit. <laughs> and they're still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that never <laughs> happened. But, you know, they used to always buy my clothes like a size and a half too large, you know. I, I blame that for the reason why I favour the snug suit now. You know, I've never gone for flowing, anything flowing or drapey. <laughs> I've always gone for the kind of snug fit of the yeah. Ivy League suit. Do you know what I'm saying? Which was, yeah. you know, that's the kind of thing I would, you know, that Leslie Nielsen was wearing in The Best of Everything and George Peppard in, uh, you know, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's, etc. That was the kind of, that was the gold standard for me, that, that, that kind of New York style of, and, you know, Cary Grant in North by Northwest, you know, those, those, Shark skin suits, you know, they weren't shiny, but they had a sheen. Yes, big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get that, you couldn't get that stuff over here. They didn't. They just didn't have that material in the tailors' shops. So, did you Shark talk to skin. tailors? And you know, did you kind of uh, do you seek out knowledge about how those looks were? Yeah, achieved? absolutely, I did. Yeah, absolutely, I, I befriended tailors all the time. My, my, I had a great uncle said. He's in the book. <laughs> My mother's uncle said he looked like Clifton Webb. Right. And uh, you remember him? Yeah, oh yes. Mr. Belvedere. 
uh, <laughs> he was kind of waspish and, uh, you know, a confirmed bachelor <laughs> and dressed accordingly, you know, but he, he dressed a bit kind of, remember Norman St. John Steve Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> he dressed like that, you know, kind of, you know, a, a mauve shirt with a white cutaway. Oh, that is confirmed yeah, about yeah, yeah. the 60s, that is. That's yeah, the definitely. Yeah, yeah. Pre, definitely. Pre, predated that whole mod thing. Yeah, because you even, it's, I was very interested in your observations about, uh, about what people were wearing, even with the arrival of the Beatles, that you, you devote quite a bit of space to analysing what the Beatles wore when they first appeared. Just tell us about that. Well, ag break? well, again, you know, where did they get those clothes? You know, this this coat I've got on now, it's what they call a shacket these days, but it's very kind of, you see pictures of Paul McCartney wearing a coat like this, you know, immediately before they had the, the Pierre Cardin style uh, numbers, you know, with no lapels at all. They were wearing these kind of button up to the neck with a Peter Pan collar kind of coats like what I'm wearing now. Classic, classic, but they weren't then they're so classic. You know, they, you might have seen them on the grouse moors of, uh, you know, north of the border, you might have seen a similar kind of a coat, but, you know, uh, never in live on, you know, Liverpool mm. teenagers. Mm. <laughs> so, and, and things like, you know, uh, tab collar shirts with tab collars, which they were the first people I saw over here wearing sub collared shirts yeah you you identify the fact that uh that, and, and rightly so that the, the beatles are the really hard living ones they're out in hamburg uh, you know living yeah, this unbelievable life yeah, while, while, while mick jagger's doing his exams you know? yeah, yeah fucking whores taking speed rolling drunk sailors <laughs> that's right while mick and keith were swatting up for their gces <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, and yet, who's the bad guys? But you yeah, know what I mean? you, uh, can't no. fight, you can't fight mythology. Which team Some, were you on? Were you, were you Team Stones <laughs> or Team Beatles? Did you say? Or, oh, or did I, you I could never. Both? It's one of those Frank or Elvis questions. That's yeah, impossible. yeah, yeah. Till the end of your life, you'll never find the answer to that because neither poaches on the other's territory. Even though the first hit by the Stones was a part was a Lennon McCartney tune. Uh, you know that, that that's an oversimplification. They never they never poach on each other's territory. Yeah, and you know credit to the Stones. You know when uh, when they started writing their own stuff, you know very quickly, it was real good, real good stuff, real great songs, very varied. You know, in a, in a different kind of way. But the Beatles, I, I, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. You know, I, I love them. Uh, Combined. Well, there's a bit where and I think you were only 11 where you managed to get into various shows, I think promoted by Don Arden. And you That's saw right, Little Richard and Eddie Cochran and Beverly yeah. Brothers in 1958. How at the age of 11, how at the age of 11 did you manage to do that? Well, you, I just didn't make a nuisance of myself and I didn't go in there team handed. You know, you can't sort of do that sort of thing team handed. But, you know, I guess, I guess I'd been on, com there's a, a lot in my book about when I was in uh, convol on convalet from the aforementioned referenced uh, tuberculosis. I, I was convale on convalescence in Rill in North Wales, a holiday resort in North Wales. And, uh, you know, I was on my own all day and not most of the time. And, uh, and I was encouraged to get out of the house. So I would leave the house on my own, you know, at 10 a.m. and come back at tea time kind of thing. So I kind of, yeah, I, I learned how to mix with people, I guess. You know, I, I would kind of run errands for the for the fairground, you know, the, the pikeys on the fairground that were, that were kind of maintaining the uh, machinery of the big wheel or so. You know, I would make myself useful. So I kind of did that when, you know, so I'd arrive in the afternoon at the Apollo in Ardwick, you know, still going today as a... As a prime venue in Manchester. Uh, beautiful Art Deco had been a movie to, you know, beautiful Art Deco thing. Looks like it ought to be made out of Baker light. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but, you know, Can you those. remember Little Richard? Oh, absolutely. Who could forget Little Richard? You know, crikey. Yeah. I, I dare you to forget Little Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was one of the first shows I ever took my little girl to see, Little Richard in Ipswich. Uh, 
you know, around 15 years ago. And uh, I thought, well, anything after this, is, have, I do, have I done her any favours here? Yes, anything absolutely. Anything after this yeah. is going to be an anti-climax. <laughs> yeah. There's a wonderful bit. D- Dave and I were both enthusing about it. You're talking about the fairgrounds, where you talk about the, the, the sensory overload of hearing yeah. those early rock and roll records, and also the mixed with the sound of the dodgems and the smell of frying onions and everything. Just, just it, describe that, because it was just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, screaming girls going down the road, rattling down the roller coaster. Yeah, the smell of uh, fried onions on the hot dog stands. Amazing. The smell of uh, rancid donuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Loads of, uh, yeah, fantastic. The, the lights were too bright. The music was louder than you could possibly get in any domestic situation. Well, that was the thing, wasn't it? It was the first time you heard pop music loud. Was it top volume? Amazing, yeah, yeah. To hear the Everly Brothers at that, you know, it it was one of the first things I remember was hearing uh, Kathy's clown on that in that situation. Amazing, and of course Elvis. Because because that's one of the things that I found most impressive about the book is I having lived through roughly the same period, is the you, you kind of reclaim a lot of those details, don't you, from kind of mythology, you know what I mean? You, you, you describe yeah, hope, the 50s but, and the 60s as it, as it was. I hope, but I hope I don't kill the mythology. You know, I, I'd hate to do that. You know, uh, mythology is a wonderful thing. And as I said before, you know, it's very often it ain't, it ain't the bald facts of uh, the matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, you just can't fight some levels you know, of mythology, you know. What's the point in trying? Yeah. What kind of world would you produce if you did destroy the mythology of this, you know, of these things? Glamour, I call it. Right. Glamour, isn't it? Right. You can't really, you know, some glamour, so there's some levels of glamour are just undamageable, isn't it? You know, Elvis, Marilyn Monroe. Right. <laughs> You know, undamageable. Definitely, definitely. I was intrigued. I wouldn't by... want to try. No, sure. Yeah. I was I was personally intrigued by the number of, of old TV adverts that this brought to mind. Or old adverts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought yeah. I'm, it's I'm, going, so I'm, nostalgic. Going, I'm going through at one point. <laughs> and I'm thinking, in a moment, surely he's going to mention this is luxury you can afford you with can Sarah afford Lord. Sarah Lord. Sure Turn the page. Next page, it it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this speaks a whole, uh, the, the promise of the future, of the not too distant future, isn't it? It is. This is luxury you can afford by Sarah Lord. Cyril Lord. Uh, there's a program on the uh, quest, I think it is, affordable luxury. I think that misses the point. You know, if it's affordable, it isn't a luxury, is it? No, I suppose not. You know, that, that, but the point about Cyril luxury, it's, there's something different about it when it's Cyril Lord. You know, it is a promise, isn't it? It's a, gold, a golden promise of a better, of a more comfortable future. But it's also amazing how those memories of those things still <laughs> stay with you after oh, all absolutely. these years. What adds? Well, ad people are geniuses. A bit, you know, if you're looking for the, you know, if you're looking for poetical geniuses, look no further than the advertising world. You know, I've done loads of adverts. You know, I'm a shameless hustler. Right. I've had to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going back to the to the sugar puffs days, uh, you know. But oh I, yeah, I the honey it. monster. I, yeah. I love doing that. <laughs> yeah, I love doing adverts, and uh, it's always so. Um, it's such a compliment because they always write the uh, scripts in my style because otherwise what's the point of having me doing it? So they write it in my style and they always say the same thing, you know, uh, feel free to uh, tweak it uh, any way you like, j- j- just as long as it sounds like you. you. So, uh, but I never have to tweak it. I never have to tweak anything with these guys, with these people in the advertising world. And it's such a compliment to have somebody... <laughs> be able to get a handle on what you do to such an obsessive degree that they can actually it is such a such a compliment and it makes life a lot easier for me as well i'm reminded here halfway through that uh, discourse about elvis you know in, in the uh, albert goldman book he mentions about elvis you know he got so many so many songs were pitched at him you know of course they were you know to have elvis sing that's the best thing that can happen to a song isn't it? Whatever, you know, it's, it's, it could sing anything. 
Yeah. yeah. So he had to, whenever they pitched a song at Elvis, he would have to, uh, he'd have to hear how he would do it. He, he more or less would be saying like, well, how would Elvis do it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and they'd have to then do a record. And there was a, a whole industry of, of Elvis Im, Im, illust, there, imitators. There is yeah. a whole album still. You can Raul get it. Glenn, Glenn Campbell did it. Glenn, did a whole album. Glenn, PJ that, Proby. That PGA, that's right. That's how he got started. Raul Donna. Yes, Raul Donna. Who later, who later went on to the cruise ships and really cleaned oh, really? up. Yeah. <laughs> All these people that could do a passable and, uh, you know, that they had to pitch it at Elvis. Yeah, yeah. In the way that yeah. Elvis would would do it. Yeah. And that's the only way that Elvis could deal with it. He was too busy to just play, you know, yeah, no. You know, he had to kind of, yeah, he had to kind of, he was time poor. Right. He was. <laughs> he, was he, he had other things, he things to get on with. He did. He had, other to things. Get on with. He had things <laughs> to get on with. Yeah. You say right <laughs> at the very beginning, you talk about poetry, saying ne never regarded as a reliable engine of wealth, which That's is right. really good. But it's really interesting because you'd start, you know, you were reading Shelley and you're reading Baudelaire and Rambo, the Liverpool poets, all this sort of stuff. But at the age of 14, you decide that you're going to be a, you know, a, a professional poet. So yeah, I figured, how why did not? you come to that conclusion at the age of 14? Well, I figured, why not? I, I, I'd read about all these. But, and of course, there is a bit of a tradition uh, of it. You know, I wouldn't enter anything that there wasn't any kind of tradition of. I mean, that would be madness. Who was it? Was it Confucius? Excellence can only be perceived within a, within a tradition. Yes. So, you know, I'm not a, a trailblazer, it, it, yeah. really. Uh, I, uh, I looked at, I'm a big fan of the, the musical, you know, the musical, the yeah. not, too distant, uh, not Too Distant History in the city of London. And uh, people like Harry Champion and uh, Gus Elan, the singing Costa monger. <laughs> you know, uh, but they all did a bit of, they all did a bit of monologue, you know. Uh, the most recent purveyor of this, I would think, would be uh, Stanley Hull. Stanley Hull. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. He, bridged, he, he went in, took it into Lionel the world Albert. of variety. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He? And, then in, and then into movies, you know, world-class yeah. movies. So it didn't do him any harm. So, but these were the only people I could point out that, Oh, and uh, who, who else? Phil Harris. Remember him, Phil Harris? Oh, the American yeah. Phil Harris. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Dark, dark Sound Poker. Oh, of course, school. yes, yes. Uh, Woodman, especially this one. Woodman, spare that tree. tree. <laughs> it was a, it was a sort of, it was, it was actually a ripoff. I found this out from reading Mad Magazine. <laughs> I had no idea. I thought he'd written it from scratch. Yes. It's a very funny. Very funny number, isn't it? So this guy that's, don't chop that tree. It's the only tree his wife can't climb. What? Go chop a birch, an elm or a pine. But save old Slippery there, that's mine. That's the <laughs> my wife can't climb, Mr. Woodman. Spare it for me. <laughs> that's fantastic. That? Well, apparently there is an original. That yes, there is. It is yeah. Victorian. Is it George, George Pope Morris. Yeah. A kind of, it's a kind of, he was a contemporary of H.W. Longfellow. And it was a kind of proto eco number, you know, a tree hugger. You know, like Victorian yeah, yeah, style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a tree hugger. An early example of the, you know, the eco friendly. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, but he took it and turned it into a marital, you know, into a slime. Yeah. You've got <laughs> to, you've got to just describe thing. the moment when you went to the embassy club and you get your first gig from the oh, proprietor, yeah. which was Bernard Manning. So just, just t t tell us about auditioning for Bernard Manning. It's amazing. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I was waiting to get cashed up at the end. And oh, well, you know, it, you know what he said? They don't like poetry here, kid. It, half of them can't fucking read. So I, had to, so I had to convince him then that, uh, you know, it was the kind of thing that might go down in Collierst. <laughs> a very rough part. And you recited a bit of, was it Salome? Yeah, Which one? Salome, you? that's yeah. right. I think, well, I knew that, uh, I knew that, the, you know, Bernard got into show business 
uh, he wasn't always a comedian. He, he got into show business as a, a singer, crooner, in the, with the uh, Oscar Rabin band, a, a, yeah. a very successful dance band who toured the Mecca circuit, you know, of, of ballrooms. There was one in every town, the length and breadth of the British Isles, and I include I mean, Wales in that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he, uh, Bernard, you know, what, very astute man. He uh, he was uh, he was the guy, and funnily enough, he, he was he was the guy that was the more R and B. You know, all all dance bands had a three part harmony, two guys and a girl. Joe Loss had Rose Brennan, uh, Ross, Ross McManus, yep. yes, that's and Larry Gretton. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so Ross you remember and, uh, the three yeah. singers with yes, that's Joe. right with Joe Loss, yeah. And they they could they were they were they they were called upon to sing as a close harmony group. Yeah, yeah. Like the Meltones in America. Yeah. And uh, and solo. And one one the girl would do the torch songs. One guy would do the slow romantic ballads, and the other one the more upbeat up, upbeat kind of you know Brooke Benson, <laughs> Nat Nat King Cole sort of bit more rootsy. Yeah. You know, and and uh, Bernard was the more rootsy end. You know, he would uh, he would do the Brooke Benton songs, things like Kiddio, which for the time was very kind of similar to Hoochie Coochie Man. It was very early kind of, you know, pre rock and roll R and B. You know, but one of them. And uh, so he, anyway, uh, he uh, they're, they're doing all right. You know, they're touring the country. And they've got a day off for three years ahead. And suddenly, uh, Bernard goes goes up to the governor, uh, Mister Re- Mister Rabin. Uh, can you? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, honour the next uh, three months, but after that, I want paying up. I'm getting out of the business. He says, "What are you crazy?" He says, "We're booked up for three years for three years already." He says, "What, what, what do you want to quit now for?" He says, "Haven't you haven't you heard that Elvis Presley?" Really, he heard. He'd heard the uh, Outbreak Hotel on the radio and, and, and just decided. Just figured it was over, all over. That's a, it's all over. We're blown out. That's a wise water. guy. That's a wise yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't going to waste his time. You know, I knew he was a wise guy. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, he'd met everybody. You know, I mean, he had the people he had on at that, at that little club. was incredible. Johnny Ray. You know, people like yeah. this. So I had a great deal of respect for him. As he was, he was really he was a prime mover at the time, and he was one person that I knew because my dad was very dismissive of my ambitions. Like you said, he didn't regard it as a as a reliable engine of wealth. Quite yeah. the reverse. So uh, he say, name one guy that's made a living out of poetry, and I, I mentioned Philip Larkin. So he, he, <laughs> so, he, so he looked it up. He asked a few questions like- around sound, and uh, and came back with he's a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, I mean, he went to a lot of trouble to discourage me from this course, is what I'm saying. Yeah. But, I, but I figured if there's one guy that will get me some kind of credibility with the old man, who would he recognize as, as a symbol of northern successful, of a successful northern bloke in show business? Who would he recognize? And Look no further than uh, the Embassy Club and Bernard Manning. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. There's so anyway, about, I, so oh I knew, God. so I knew that I knew that he he would recognise the world depicted in this poem that I'd just written, Salome, uh, 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 set in the, on the Mecca circuit. It even gets a mention the Mecca circuit, doesn't it? Anyway, I give him these two lines. Uh, when the ambulances came, she was lying on the deck. She fell off her stiletto wheels and broke her fucking neck. So he fuck, so he cracked up at that. You know, he said, oh, that's the, that's the Ritz all over that. It's setting the Ritz in. It's still going as a rock and roll venue now in Manchester, but then it was a ballroom. <laughs> where, where, the kind of place where Bernard would sing. I oh, he says, that. that's, that's, a, the that's the Ritz all over. Yeah, so that's that the couple that launches your career, really. Yeah, 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 that is, yeah. yeah. But he loved that broke her fucking neck. Yeah, you love that bit. Oh, ah, that's all right. I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he is. The first, so he's the first guy to pay me cash money for doing what I do. How much did you get? It was something like that. It was about eight quid. Right. Okay. But it's about eight quid. But that was nineteen. You know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sixty-five. 
for something. Six, I don't At know one point, you say it. that comedy was a, was a blood sport. Was that him? Oh, that they, was, well, you was were... there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, what did you mean by that? It's brilliant. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they just... It, it was... Uh, if they didn't like you, it was... If, if it's comedy or poetry, the, the, the thing I've got in common with comedians is that uh, I hope I'm funny. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. But uh, is that we've only, you know, we ain't got no backing seats. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's indifference. That, that's your enemy. Indifference. You know, it's, it, they wouldn't re even really get hostile. They'd just start talking to each other. They'd, they'd decide they didn't like it. And they'd just start having, and then you'd just look like a pudding. So that was what I was really, I was really terrified of indifference, you know. But uh, it, it, it wasn't as bad as you might imagine. Right. It wasn't as bad as you might imagine. It's funny. I just think I, I was on early. I was on early in the evening as well, so it could. It might have got more hostile. Uh, and <laughs> the booze more sanked up. Yeah. Although in them, yeah. although in them days, it was a. I don't know about. I, I don't think the uh, the embassy went along with this, but most of the clubs in the centre of Manchester weren't allowed to sell full strength beer. Oh really. Yeah, yeah, you didn't want trouble in a place with nice upholstery and what have you. <laughs> it, was an, it, was an, it was an understanding yeah. you know, that people it didn't sell proper beer. I love, I, I'm sorry, just a, a reminder when Mark was referring to the engine, uh, poetry and an engine of wealth. There's okay. some wonderful turns of phrase in here. Lots of them just introducing really prosaic terms in, in the circumstances yeah. of you're not expecting them. I was just looking at the thing. Where you were sharing a you're sharing a flat or house or what with Nico and John Cale moved in, and you said he didn't keep up his he didn't keep up his <laughs> his end on the domestic front. I thought it was just perfect. It is. But, but I did qualify I did, that, didn't it I? It speaks <laughs> volumes, <laughs> doesn't it? You can just see, of his remit or something. You can just see a man permanently uh, lying on a sofa with the ashtray <laughs> beside him. I know. end up sharing a flat with two members of the Velvet Underground. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah, incredible, yeah, yeah. that, isn't it? Wow, yeah. Because I was a massive fan of theirs, obviously. Yeah, I was a massive right. fan of Velvet Underground, yeah. obviously. Right. So in the light of the, the success of this, which is just coming out in paperback, I believe, um, yes, right. Yeah, out now. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. my bank. Gotta, gotta flip, um, uh, every home should have one, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your next plan <clears throat> on the writing front? I mean, have you got to go back and write part two, stuff I forgot or whatever? Oh, there's a lot of stuff that didn't make the cut there. Oh, really? You know, crikey. Yeah, yeah. Loads of stuff. Yeah. 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 What kind but, of things did you leave out? <laughs> Well, I just wanted to have some sort of trajectory. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. uh, you know what I'm like with details. So if I was like that about, you know, it was either, I think it's better to sort of give an, you know, uh, you know, it's got some sort of, point is I, I had my eye, I, I, when I wrote it, I thought, I, I, I was thinking about, how am I going to, am I, I going to squeeze this for every dollar I can in the limited time I have yeah. left? And uh, so I had an eye for the, movie rights right all the time in fact my editor the lovely uh rosemary davidson so i couldn't have done it without her she uh she remarks on how little i uh how little feeling there is in there but she would she would do she's a chick right <laughs> <laughs> so i said well you know you can't film a feeling rose oh okay that's i'm looking for the movie rights on this and anyway, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of bollocks in, uh, in especially in pop lyrics, isn't there? That you can uh, that you can. She thought you, you, people think you can film a feeling, but I say right. no. Okay. And, and in in pop lyrics, you're always I can see by your eyes. You can't see anything by anybody's <laughs> eyes. <laughs> they look the same, whatever they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, that's, now that is an urban myth. I'm quite willing to shatter. But there what's is the other. What's the other? There's, a, there's another one of them. Yeah, that's carry on. I'm, oh, I was just going to say. Because there is, um, I can't detect a trace of self-pity anywhere in the book. 
Right. Good. Well, I mean, what have I got to have any self pity about? You know, it's it, like it says on my newly released paperback edition of my last volume of poetry, the luckiest guy alive. Well, I, I mean, when I call it, there's not a trace of irony in there. The luckiest guy alive. I, you know, I, I, you know, I love the life I live, and I live the life I love, isn't it? <laughs> You got to live. So what's next? Yourself, you you MC <laughs> nobody yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> you, you MC. Well, I wouldn't go event. that far. But no. I wouldn't yeah. say it's a James Brown levels, but you know, I mean, I, I, it's great to earn a living doing what you probably would do anyway. Although saying that, I ain't written nothing in the pandemic. There's no point. Well, like because I'm not, you haven't got I'm, an audience to. That's exactly it. I've, I've sort of become that kind of people, man o the people. You know the people, the po- the citizen poet. If there's nobody there, to, there to give me some instant, carefully Feedback. considered ten minutes of carefully considered adulation over. It. <laughs> 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 what, what's the point? <laughs> you know, I'm not one of these people who sees it as any kind of therapy or yeah. in poetry. It doesn't make you a better person. In fact, quite the reverse. It's a self, you know, it's a self-centered kind of universe, really, isn't it? So now that they, and, and, that, and that, uh, uh, that's another thing as well. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a self-centered, uh, self-obsessed, isn't it? Kind of thing to be doing. So uh, it doesn't it doesn't make you uh, a better person. In fact, that's the first line of the only bit of poetry I've written in lockdown. Actually. Uh, 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 Every cunt's a poet these days, <laughs> as, as opposed. Every cunt's a poet now, as opposed to the other way round. <laughs> so when when will you resume? Uh, when you you're, resume? You're touring again, Sue. Are you out in October or something? One at a time, chaps. Yeah. One at a time. Sorry, so you're touring again in in, in October, aren't you? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm overdue, you know, obviously I'm overdue 18 months. So you did, you just as lovely bit at the end where you MC an event with Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and then you're oh, immortal. Great, yeah. That must have been amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It yeah. was in, in Spain. Yeah. That was great, yes, Chuck. He used to dismantle his songs in a different way every night. It endlessly inventive. You know, people say he just churned it out to all them, but that's not true. It, you know, he kept it fresh for himself. Yeah. And he was still doing the splits when I, when I knew him, you know. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Unbe- unbelievably handsome guy. Yeah. Can you do, can you do the splits, Brown-eyed John? handsome man. Yeah. <laughs> Brown-eyed handsome man. Losing the song. There you go. <laughs> but, so, you know, what, what, a, what a, a fantastic song, Smith. Yeah. What's, your favorite, what's your favourite Chuck Berry song? Oh, too much monkey business. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I love that one. That's fantastic. Right. Very good. It's, uh, I always, I always used to say, I'm not the first guy or the last guy to say it. I'm sure uh, that that's uh, that's why Bob Dylan uh, wrote Subterranean Homesick Blues. I, I, I stand by that today because I was in a couple of uh, you know combos in the group, you know, in the you know the Vendettas, the Lovely Flowers, and there was a couple of. Uh, a couple of tunes that we would, I, I insisted we always do. And one was First I Look at the Purse by the, the Consors. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and the other one was, uh, oh, I had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, shit. You have a lovely um, line about Bob Dylan. You say, I'm always getting compared to Bob Oh, yeah. Dylan. The other one was Too Much Monkey Business. Oh, but right. I could okay. ne- but I could never get all the words to it to it and in them days you had to put the needle on the beginning again i reckon that's what bob did i think he took the shortcut there and uh, wrote his own <laughs> well john it's, <laughs> a fan- it's a fantastic book really and, brilliant uh, book thanks Which, lads thanks very much it very really nice is genuinely the thoroughly we absolutely thoroughly just, enjoyed it we've been texting each other all week sending each other <laughs> our favorite lines absolutely <laughs> oh. amazing uh, it, was, it was it was absolutely terrific, and uh, and you'll be back in people's um, in people's backyard quite soon. Well, in October, you reckon? Well, that's the plan, yeah. Right, okay. And um, well, best of luck with that. Yeah, good luck Thanks with the luck. tour. Good amateurs. luck with the tour. Yeah, <laughs> good luck Thanks with the so tour. much, John. It was really yeah. good fun. Right.